1863, the world of billiards was in trouble. Ivory, the standard material for billiard balls, was in short supply. Blame the elephants. To solve the problem, one of the biggest names in the game offered a $10,000 reward, that's more than $100,000 today, to anyone who could come up with a new, more sustainable way to produce them. Enter John Wesley Hyatt. You know what he worked with? Plastics. His solution was to pump molten synthetic plastic into a mold, and not only did he change the game forever, he also invented injection molding, the process still used to make most plastic items today. It's a fantastic story in the history of plastic, but as you probably already know, there's also a dark side to the revolutionary invention. The world changed a lot in the mid to late 19th century, when the precursors of modern plastics first appeared. Among them were vulcanized rubber, invented in 1839, and shellac, a resin derived from beetle shells, developed in 1856. The Victorian era also brought the first semi-synthetics, including super light polystyrene, discovered by accident in Germany in 1839. Some of these breakthroughs laid the groundwork for the technologies that defined the early 20th century. In 1869, John Wesley Hyatt patented his so-called celluloid, a cheap substitute for natural products like ivory and tortoiseshells we've already talked about. But its biggest impact was on entertainment, becoming the basis for the film used in motion pictures. This is the one I'll be remembered for. Sort of. No one really remembers him today, but anyway. The 19th century produced several semi-synthetics, and the early 20th ushered in the first thermosetting plastics and thermoplastics, many of which are still used today. Now, the biggest leap in plastic production came in 1909 with the invention of the first true plastic, phenol formaldehyde. It soon became world famous under its brand name, Bakelite. The material was named after its New York-based inventor, Leo Hendrik Bakeland, who had already made his fortune in the 1890s with Velox photographic paper. Anyway, in the early 1900s, Bakeland turned his attention to finding a replacement for beetle-derived shellac, which was becoming scarce. After years of trial and error, he perfected the process using his steam pressure bakelizer machine. It allowed him to control the temperature at which phenol and formaldehyde combined into a polymer, which could then be mixed with fillers. The result was a plastic that was both moldable and durable, and useful in countless applications. The success of Bakelite made Leo Bakeland rich. Over his career, he filed some 400 patents. He was openly driven by profit. When asked what led him to Bakelite, he pulled an Adam Sandler. I'm a big fan of money. Aren't we all, Leo? Aren't we all? But Bakelite wouldn't hold the monopoly on synthetic plastics for long. Synthetic polymers emerged during the 20th century as inventors followed in Leo Bakelite's footsteps. So if you don't know, synthetic polymers are man-made, created through chemical reactions that arrange their building blocks, called monomers, into repeating patterns. These monomers are usually carbon, and the polymers made this way occur nowhere else in nature. The science behind them is nearly the same, but the results vary widely. Polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, was first made in 1872, but it was nearly useless until 1926 when the BF Goodrich company patented a plasticized version. Not long after that came polyvinylidene chloride, better known as Saran, of Saran Wrap fame, discovered by accident in a Dow Chemical Lab in 1933. Saran Wrap, the transparent food wrap that clings to any shape to keep food fresher. Low-density polyethylene followed in 1935. Acrylic, polyurethane, and nylon would all arrive before the end of the decade, with more synthetics to come. Now, synthetic polymers are everywhere because they're so useful, even if their potential wasn't clear when they were first created. For example, Dow Chemical needed 20 years to bring saran wrap to market after inventing saran in 1933 though its practicality seems obvious to us today. Bakelite marked a revolution in how scientists thought about plastics. It transformed the automobile, aerospace, and electronics industries, ushering in a new era of modern technologies that would be unthinkable without hard, durable plastics. Innovation in plastics was also fueled by necessity. As World War II loomed in the late 1930s, Western nations remilitarized and pushed for hardy, reliable materials to support the war efforts and replace scarce traditional ones. Nylon, invented in 1935 as a synthetic alternative to costly silk, quickly became essential for parachutes, ropes, and other military gear. Today, synthetic polymers are in everything from clothes to packaging. They're also vital to complex machinery, surgical implants, and innumerable other parts of modern life. So it's great, right? Yeah, you knew this one was coming like a great heel turn. You're plastic, cold, shiny, hard plastic. Those same unique properties have made the plastics industry an existential threat to the natural world. It turns out that they are actually non-biodegradable. 
Unlike natural materials, they don't break down through contact with bacteria. Instead, many common plastics take hundreds of years to decompose, causing enormous environmental harm along the way. The problem isn't just that most plastics aren't reusable, piling up in mountains of trash that won't disintegrate anytime soon. Their durability means that once they enter the environment, they stay there, blocking waterways, disrupting habitats, and spreading damage. And when plastics do break down, the result is often toxic. Some synthetic polymers release pollutants when exposed to heat and sunlight. Burning them produces clouds of poisonous smoke. Others leach harmful chemicals such as toxic copper salts into the soil. You know who really hates plastics? Oceans, where much of what's manufactured ends up, causing untold damage to habitats and sea life. Plastic's durability and its ability to be shaped into almost anything means that plastic refuse can become hazardous, especially to larger sea creatures and birds, which often become entangled in it. Campaigns have long highlighted the harm caused by six-pack rings from soda and beer cans, which can trap sea turtles and other animals but the danger goes beyond that. Creatures can get caught in all kinds of plastic debris, from abandoned fishing gear to everyday trash. Worse still, plastics can make their way inside animals' bodies, either because they're mistaken for food or inhaled, leading to further harm. Plastics also leach chemicals into seawater, turning it toxic for marine life and destroying ecosystems like coral reefs and underwater vegetation. Much of this happens on a scale invisible to the naked eye. Yet, the sheer amount of plastic pollution is undeniable once you know about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, a mass of mostly plastic waste. It's not a giant trash island like you may have heard. If you fly above it, you would only see ocean. Instead, it's dispersed over millions of square miles. These accumulations form where ocean currents converge, and there are five of them worldwide, the Pacific Patch being the largest. Now, just like the ocean, the human body is vulnerable to plastic pollution, an everyday reality that's causing serious health problems across the globe. In recent years, one of the most troubling aspects of this pollution has taken center stage, microplastics. These are fragments that break off from larger pieces of plastic and keep splitting into smaller and smaller bits, instead of decomposing the way natural materials do. Microplastics are everywhere, from the deepest trenches of the ocean to the peak of Mount Everest. Even more alarming, they've been found inside living organisms. The first discovery was in plankton back in the 1970s. Since then, microplastics have been identified in more than 1,300 species, including humans. They show up in major organs, including the brain, heart, stomach, reproductive organs, and even the placenta. With microplastics now so widespread, researchers are now racing to understand their impact on our health. Evidence is mounting. A 2024 study linked microplastics and arterial plaque to higher risks of heart attack, stroke, and death among heart patients. And because plastic production involves over 10,000 chemicals, there's a mountain of research ahead. What's more unsettling is how unavoidable exposure has become. Still, there are small steps people can take, like cutting down on plastic use in the kitchen and choosing fewer plastic-wrapped foods. Considering the huge ecological and public health risks of plastics, it seems obvious that their use in modern life calls for a major rethink with bold action needed to limit their spread and reduce their presence in the natural world and through contamination in our own bodies. But sadly, the statistics show plastic use worldwide is moving in the opposite direction. Get these lovely washable plastic roses free when you buy these favorite Procter & Gamble household helpers. Back in 1950, the world produced around 2 million tons of plastic. Today, studies indicate we produce more than 450 million tons, 91% which isn't recycled. At the same time, the amount of plastic waste entering landfills and the wider natural world keeps climbing. The UN Environment Program estimates that more than 19 million tons of plastic now enter oceans, lakes, and rivers each year the equivalent of 2,000 garbage trucks worth every single day. Experts say one of the biggest problems in the plastic supply chain is the poor waste management. Recycling, safe landfill storage, and safe incineration of certain plastics are the main ways to handle waste. Yet, about a fifth of all plastic produced still isn't processed by any of these methods. Improving waste management is considered one of the key ways to fight growing plastic pollution, though some experts believe more radical solutions are now needed. Thankfully, several organizations are already well underway with efforts to clean up the mess we've already made, particularly in the oceans. The Ocean Cleanup is a project aimed directly at tackling the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It uses technology which targets areas of high plastic concentration created by ocean currents and sends trawlers with vast nets to capture and extract the plastic for recycling back on land. The endeavor is scalable, and organizers project that with an investment of around $7.5 billion, it could clear the entire Great Pacific garbage patch within 10 years. However, the project has faced criticism for bycatch of marine life and issues with waste processing.
processing on land. Many scientists and conservationists are looking to bioplastics, materials with the same practical uses as traditional plastics but capable of properly biodegrading, as a potential solution to the world's plastic pollution problem. In 2024, researchers revealed that a new form of cellulose diacetate, a bioplastic made from wood pulp, breaks down in seawater even faster than paper. Technologies like this could radically reduce the amount of non-biodegradable plastics entering the oceans. Now, some modern solutions to the plastic pollution crisis sound like they were ripped straight out of the pages of science fiction. The microbots are controlled with this neurotransmitter. But nanobots are real, and real tiny, just 50 to 100 nanometers wide, and scientists are learning to program them for a wide range of useful, autonomous functions. In medicine, they're being used to deliver drugs to targeted parts of the body, measure blood sugar levels just under the skin, and more. Now it seems the same technology might be harnessed to deal with the microscopic plastic particles polluting our planet. Critics have raised concerns that projects such as the ocean cleanup, while potentially affected by certain measures, have little chance of addressing the smallest plastic particles now choking marine ecosystems. These fragments, even smaller than microplastics, are called nanoplastics and measure less than 200 nanometers. Experiments have shown that self-propelled metal organic nanobots can capture these nanoplastics in water and then absorb them as fuel. Deploying them at scale could provide an effective way to remove micro and nanoplastics from our oceans, giving ecosystems a chance to recover. Experiments in recent years have also explored plastic-eating fungi, while other studies have looked at mealworms that can consume plastics, including styrofoam. But for now, implementing proposed solutions on a scale that can tackle the worldwide plastics pollution crisis still feels a long way off. With plastic production and waste continuing to grow alongside the global population, experts stress that governments urgently need to step up and get an effective action plan off the ground. And no, the solution isn't going back to ivory, so the elephants are safe. One way to do this would be to deliver an ambitious plastics pollution treaty, something campaigners say must be agreed upon at the United Nations. In the summer of 2025, the UN Environment Program met to develop an international, legally binding treaty on plastics pollution. While nations such as China have taken steps like banning plastic bags, there is still a long way to go to get our plastic problem under control.